a definition of faith. Now, recently I have uh, been looking into a word that I think I have uh, neglected in my faith teaching. Now, it's, I haven't neglected the message that I'm talking about, but I have neglected uh, the uh, word. And that's the word obedience. Obedience. Now, the message that I preach that deals with obedience is entitled, Be Ye Doers of the Word. Now, you may want to go back and get your old tape on Be Ye Doers of the Word and, and hear this message again, and I'm sure that there will be a, some of it that you will uh, recognize as I talk to you today. But there will be some of it you won't recognize. Now, the word obedience is not found uh, in the New Testament like it is found in the Old Testament. Now, the word faith is not found in the Old Testament like it's found in the New Testament. But uh, what we're really doing today is defining faith by using the word obedience. Obedience. And we're talking about be ye doers of the word. And that just cares with it, doesn't it? Obedience. Now, we're going to talk to you about uh, obedience is, uh, is just doing the Word of God. Now, faith is the... Now, uh, Hebrews 11, uh, 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, there's a French translation that renders this uh, verse, faith renders present that which one hopes for. Now, there's obedience. Faith renders present that which one hopes for. That thing for which you're hoping, when you have real faith, you render its present. You act as if it's present. Now, that's real, genuine faith. Now, that's a little heavy to dump on you right off. I realize that. A little mystical also. But you will handle it through prayer and seeking the Lord and He will make His way clear in you. Now, faith is mentioned in Romans 3, 27 and 28. And faith is also mentioned throughout the book of James. You, you get several chapters uh, begin at the 2nd chapter, 14th verse, right on through the end of that chapter, talking about faith. And uh, then the first book of James, the first chapter in James, 23rd verse, right on through, we have uh, uh, some more scriptures dealing with faith. And in fact, you go all over James, you find the word of faith. But when you look at faith in James, you almost have to relate it to another word, and that's the word works. And um, it's very interesting because Martin Luther had a little trouble with uh, faith in James because he couldn't handle that thing of works. So um, he had a little trouble. He had some tough things to say about the book of James. Now, he says the key to this thing is faith without works, and that's Romans 3, 27, 28. It says man is saved uh, with, by faith without works. And there's no question about that. A amen? Now, let me read those verses to you. Romans 3, 27, 28. There is, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, by the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. In other words, Romans is saying that a man is saved... By grace through faith, that not of himself, it's a gift of God. In other words, a man is saved by trusting the Lord without works. But James says something else. He says, what doth, in the second chapter of the 14th verse, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? Uh -huh, listen to that. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So, uh, James says that the man um, has faith and works. So what's the situation here? It looks like that James says that a man must have faith and works. 
Now, here's what we have to see. And this is uh, beautiful to get this down, get it clear, and possibly you already understand this. Romans is talking about a man being justified in redemptive salvation. The only way to be made right with Jesus Christ is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, in James, we're talking about being justified before man. So James is saying, if you have got justifying faith, faith that saves, if you've got saving faith, it works to where man can see that it works. And it's obvious that you have saving faith. Isn't that something? So, James is saying, if you say you have a faith that doesn't work, then your faith is futile. That uh, 14th verse of uh, that second chapter says, What doth it profit my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and not works? Can faith save him? Uh, Weymouth translation says, What doth it profit my brethren, though a man say he hath faith, and hath not corresponding action? Can that kind of faith save him? Oh, no. Uh, you see, what I'm saying here is, when a man has faith, his life has corresponding action. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? There's corresponding action to his life. You say, Brother uh, Manley, what do you mean? Well, God, when a man has faith, God works in him, God works through him, and God works for him. And uh, this is so beautiful. Jesus said to the Pharisees when they said, Our father, uh, we know our father Abraham. He said, Yes, if you had, uh, if you knew your father Abraham, you would be doing the works of Abraham. And Jesus laid it on them. And that's what James is saying to us. He said, If you know Jesus, you will be doing the works of Jesus. If you know Jesus, you will be doing the works of Jesus. Now, isn't that beautiful? I tell you, that is so helpful to me. So what we're saying here is, we are defining faith. And we're talking about what is faith. And we're talking about faith and works. In other words, there is some evidence of a faith that really works. Now, a man uh, says he has faith in Jesus. He's a changed person, isn't he? He's a new creation in Christ Jesus. He has a hunger for the Word of God. There are some obvious evidence in his life that he has saving, saving faith. First chapter, the 22nd verse in the King James translation. It says this, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. So whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but listen, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridle not his tongue, but dis divided, deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless, and to widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. All right, here's what I want to say to you about be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. How, how can a person be a doer of the word of God? Now, this is interesting. How can a person be a doer of the Word of God. Now, if he has saving faith, he's going to be a doer of the Word of God. Now, it takes time to grow into spiritual maturity. But the key to this growth is being a doer of the Word of God. In the economy of God, God is constantly bringing 
the believer in Christ Jesus, the man with real faith, into light. The light from the Word of God. He uses the Word, the Holy Spirit, circumstances, and so on. And he brings a man to the light. And when a man receives the light, he becomes a doer of the Word. Uh, you could put it this way. When a man receives the Word, he becomes a doer of the Word. Or he becomes a rejecter of that Word. Learning how to be a doer of the Word. This is uh, faith, being a doer of the Word. Well, we're going to talk about how to be a doer of the Word. Now, this may uh, be a shock to you, but the only way that a man can be a doer of the Word is by choice. He has to make a choice to be a doer of the Word. He has to make a choice to to not be a doer of the Word. Now, that may sound very interesting to you. Now, a lot of folk have misunderstood me at uh, my teaching on faith because I say that uh, the grace of faith is that ability within you to choose light or reject light. Now, there's different types of faith than the, the grace of faith. There's the gift of faith and the impartation of faith. But I say that uh, this man has a choice. So I, I'm right back to finding this matter of faith. So when we come to this thing of trusting the Lord, or when we come to this thing of being a doer of the Word, we have to be a doer of the Word by choice. The, when that choice, that right choice, when the truth, let me back up a little bit, when the truth is presented to any of us, and then the choice is made to obey the truth. It's made in the heart. It's made in the heart. And when that choice is made, then we release the enabling grace to enable us to do carry out this work. What is that verse of Scripture uh, in Philippians where it says that God works His will in you and works His will uh, through you? What is that verse? You know it probably better than I do. Yes, here it is. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You see, this verse says that it's God who works his will in you. In other words, give you light. And then it's God that works his will through you. But between the giving you of light and God working his will through you, there has to be an obedience on your part, on my part. There has to be a decision in us to cooperate with God. If this wasn't the case, then man would be nothing much more than a robot. In fact, he wouldn't be anything more than a robot. Now, this um, enables God that, to give us light. This life, a Christian life, enables God to give us light. And we are enabled by the grace of God to make the right choice, to be a doer of the Word, and when that right choice is made, then the Holy Spirit enables us to carry out that choice. And uh, that, that is so beautiful, to be a doer of the Word of God. Now, let me just try to illustrate what I'm talking about. And I think this will help you. The um, Lord has taken His time, it seems, to just teach me by experience a lot of this truth. And I trust that I, he will not have to take you through the experiences he took me through. But I remember one time being in South Carolina at a camp meeting. And um, this camp meeting was stalled down over a matter of an offering. They had singing that particular night. And uh, the singing was quite uh, arousing. The people, this was a Baptist bunch of people, but boy, they were shouters. Now, I realize that many of you that are listening to me cannot conceive of a bunch of Baptist people shouting. And I'll assure you, this was not a Pentecostal meeting. It was a Baptist meeting. And this was back uh, almost 20 years ago when uh, you did not have a lot of mixture of Pentecostalism in any particular Baptist church. Not in at all. 
uh, Pentecostalism. Not any at all of that was in this particular meeting. It was just a, a good meeting. But they didn't. They had done a lot of singing, got people quite roused, and they were shouting all over the place. They were shouting all over that place. And uh, so um, as I um, sat there while they took the offering up, I had eight dollars in my pocket, and uh, they took up offering like this. Who will give twenty? And then who will give ten? And they weren't in my range. Then who will give five? And they got in my range. And I said to the Lord, Well, Lord, I will give three, and I will keep the five. And uh, then I turned. Lord didn't say a thing to me. Then I turned around and said, Lord, I'll give the five. And keep the three. Now, the reason I was wanting to hang on to that money is I had gone off from home and left my shaving kit. And uh, I needed to replace my shaving kit, at least with the equipment for shaving, uh, before I could go to church the next morning. So I needed, I thought I needed the five. And uh, for sure I had to have the three. But I talked to the Lord about the three, about the five, and the Lord said nothing to me. So when God gets silent on you and me, uh, you know, it's not God that needs to change. It's not God that has the first next move. So I um, really um, wondered what was going on, but I waited. And uh, they got through with the offering, and I had not given anything. So uh, they asked me to come up and thank the Lord for the offering. Now, I was a visitor there. This was my first time to have ever been to a camp meeting in that part of the world and like that. And so uh, I, I was quite amused. I, I was amazed. I was blessed. But it was quite different. So I uh, sat there. I got up to, to offer uh, thanks for the offering. And you know, God does deal with me sometimes in a very severe way. I'm sure just like he does you. And the Lord said to me, he said, I didn't take this offering. He said, you can't thank me for this offering. So I told these people, I said, now, folk, God did not take this offering. God did not take this offering, so I'm not going to thank him for it. I said, this is not an offering. I said, do you love Jesus? Oh, amen. Man, they started shouting on me. I said, do you believe that the Bible, the Bible says what it means and means what it says? Boy, they started shouting again. I said, well, if you are not a bunch of hypocrites just shouting and just praising God, and just running around here uh, making mock of God. I said, why don't you become a doer of the Word of God and not a hearer only? Well, this really shocked people. It really shocked them because um, they uh, obviously did not know how to be a doer of the Word. And uh, so they uh, were listening. I said, listen to what the Word of God says. It says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with them, it shall be measured to you again. I said, there's the word of God. How many of you believe that's the word of God? Boy, they started shouting. I said, well, why don't you be a doer of the word if the Lord will let you? Why don't you act on the word and give unto God, not to this camp meet? but unto God and claim this promise. Be a doer of the word. He said if you give unto him, he will press it down, shake it together, run it over, cause men to give unto your bosom. I said, why don't you do that? Well, it got quiet. It got extremely quiet. Well, you know what? After a while, they began to obey the Lord. Obey the Lord. Obedient. Be a doer of the word. Well, then, uh, the offering was taken, and the Lord said, Okay, son, uh, I want all you've got. Well, now I was faced with them with being a doer of the word. I said, Well, Lord, if I give you all I've got, you'll have to perform a miracle to get me to church in the morning. He said, Well, uh, I'm in the miracle business. So, you know what? Boy, then I was faced with being a doer of the word. Give, and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. So then I was faced with this question. And so then I had to become a doer of the word. 
And I did. I gave my $8. And do you know, before I got out of that meeting that night, do you know there was about $40 placed in my pockets? Do you know, not only that, but a man came up to me and said, I have a uh, shaving kit with all the equipment in it and out in my glove compartment, and I want you to have it. I mean, God, God met with me. That blew my mind. But what I learned, I learned I got just a little glimpse of how to be a doer of the Word of God. And I, I was brought to the place of choice. I said, I'm going to make this choice. I saw some light in the Word of God that if you give, it shall be given unto you good measure, pressed down, running over, shall men to give unto your bosom. And I was when I got that light, then I had to make that choice to do it. And I did it, and God supernaturally blessed. Now, I'm trying to define to you how to be a doer of the Word of God. Now, this changed my life. It changed my life. I, I, I was talking to an uh, uh, outstanding preacher in America in the last three weeks. And he said, you know, my life was changed. In fact, this preacher is not only an outstanding Amer preacher in America. He, he has invitations from all over the world. An outstanding, one of the great Bible teachers of our day. He said, my life was changed over learning that truth, how to be a doer of the Word of God over finances. Hmm. That's interesting, isn't it? Well, let me give you another illustration. This other illustration is very important. Um, I was in Jackson, Mississippi one time in a meeting, and this lady came down the aisle after a morning service and said, Brother Manley, I have a neighbor, a friend that I have been trying to win to Jesus ever since we were kids in high school. Her husband is a gambler. She needs Christ. She's not saved. She needs to be born again. And said, I have uh, tried my best to win her to Jesus. And said, this week I've called her to get her to come to the meeting, and her maid tells me she's not in. Said, I know she's in, and I just do not know how to reach her. I said, well, I'll make a proposition with you. I said, um, you go home and ask Jesus to show you every sin in your life that would hinder you from trusting him for your lost friend and then come back to me. So the next morning, about Thursday morning, she came back. And you could tell she'd been weeping. She'd been seeking the Lord. She came to me and said, Preacher, she said, I've come said, there's nothing between me and my Savior. What can I do? I said, Sister, the Bible says, if two of us agree touching anything, he'll do it. Will you trust Jesus with me that Jesus is saving that woman now? She said, uh, I can't do that. How will he do it? I said, that's how he does it. It's not your business. Will you trust Jesus that Jesus is saving her now on the basis of to agree. She said, I'll do it. Did you know she made that choice? She made that choice to be a doer of the word. If to agree touching anything, the Lord will do it. And I believe that's understood. If two have been drawn together by the Holy Spirit and they agree on something, God will do it. And so, I mean, she agreed and she believed and that was on Thursday morning. And I want you to know, on Sunday morning, that woman walked the aisle and was saved by the grace of God. She was gloriously saved. And she told the story about how she became so convicted she couldn't stand it. And how she couldn't stand it. She called her friend, her Christian friend, and asked her if she could come to church. And she came to church, heard the message, and was saved by the grace of God. Be ye a doer of the word, and not a hearer only. Learning how to be a doer of the word is one of the great responsibilities of a Christian. I pray that you'll learn how to be a doer of the word.